story of Naaman. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Make the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? <clears throat> Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. Let's now just have a, a moment of quietness as we come to God's word. Father, we do thank you that we've been able to sing so hardly about an old, old story. And yet it's an old, old story that is so needed, that is so powerful that is so relevant to the day and age in which we live, a story that affects the lives of every single person who's <laughs> ever lived, and a story that will affect our destiny in eternity. Oh Lord, may that story this morning penetrate to the very heart of our being. If we've not understood something of the joy and wonder of salvation before, then this morning, Lord, reveal that truth to us. If we've hesitated from response, then Lord, this morning, just with your, uh, your power of your spirit, just prod our hearts, prick our hearts in order to respond. But Lord, we pray that we will be a united body of people, knowing the joy of salvation, having responded to the message and having enthroned in our hearts by faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. 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 If you have a Bible with you, you may like to turn back to um, the second book of Kings, 
if you've got a New Testament only, then you won't be able to turn back to the second book of Kings. But I, I think it's wonderful that here, right in the heart of the Old Testament, part of the Bible that possibly is pretty hard going, particularly for newer Christians, we have this wonderful picture of salvation. An individual, uh, which I think you will find that we can relate to all of the individuals that come in this wonderful story. But it's a story of, of God's care about a person, an individual. God's dealing with a person, an individual. And God's cleansing an individual as well. So we look at this lovely story here um, in the Old Testament. And I, I don't know what your first impression would be of the main character, Naaman. I used to have a Bible at um, school. They used to give everyone Bibles when I was at school, hundreds of years ago, but, uh, <laughs> um, and they had pictures. And alongside 2 Kings, chapter 5, there was this picture of Naaman. Now, it was a very, very impressive picture indeed. He was a fine-looking man. He was a strong-looking man. He was uh, dressed well, and uh, he looked uh, quite a significant almost terrifying character. And we're given that picture of Naaman, that he's a man of great position and in many ways, great strength. It says that he was commander of the army of the King of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master. He was highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory uh, to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. What a picture. And it was an impressive picture indeed. And then comes one little word that changes <laughs> the whole story. <coughs> but. But. You could have many sermons on the buts in the Bible. Have you ever preached on the word but? No, I, I think I did once many, many years ago. But you run out of space and time because there's just so many. But we know, don't we, the buts of life. And those buts change the whole direction very often that we are heading. It changes our attitude, it changes our prospects, it changes our outlook. I guess looking back to Eddie until that particular test he took some weeks ago, he had no idea that he had that particular health problem. No idea that he was gonna face such a major operation so soon. The plans for these weeks had to be changed, that but came in. And I say that I think we can relate ourselves to the characters in this story. So how really can we relate to Naaman? Oh, I'm not a commander of any troops. And, uh, no, never even in the Boy Scouts, let alone <laughs> the commander of troops and such like. And I wouldn't make such an impressive picture um, that Naaman did. But there's a but. There's a but. Whatever may, may think of our lives and what others may think of our lives, however beautiful and however powerful that picture may be, but we're sinners. We're sinners. And just as that leprosy was eating away and ruining the prospects of Naaman's life, so sin does that in each and every one of us if it's not dealt with. Paul says, doesn't he, when he writes to the Romans in chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's 25 or so of us here, I guess, this morning. We're, we're all the same. We have a heart that is prone to sin. We have a nature that has this inbuilt disease of sin, which has spread right through from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So whatever our life is, however great it may be or not at the present time, but we're sinners. We're sinners. Just to emphasise the seriousness of this but in his life, because it was going to change everything. There would be no more great victories. He would no longer be the person who was so respected and admired. His disease was going to eat away and was going to ruin his whole life. And if you uh, look back, if you, if you can stomach a few verses from Leviticus, they're never very easy. Any of you reading Bibles now, and you perhaps for the first time, uh, be careful when you get into Leviticus. But I, I do want to read a few verses from chapter 13, 
because the seriousness of this but, the difference it was going to make to his life, is so emphasised here. It said there that the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, when anyone has a swelling or a rash or a bright spot on his skin that may become an infectious skin disease, he must be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of the sons who is a priest. The priest is to examine the sore on his skin. Aren't you glad you come? This is, this is great stuff, isn't it? Uh, the priest is to examine the sore on his skin and if the hair in the sore has turned white and the sore appears to be more than skin deep, it is an infectious skin disease. When the priest examines him, he will pronounce him ceremonially unclean. Wow, that really is encouraging Bible reading. Have you ever preached on that passage? <laughs> There's a challenge for you. I, I to say that with a smile because I, I came across um, in daily bread reading some time back um, a little passage, um, based, a little thought based on Leviticus chapter 13 <coughs> that we just looked at. And it's entitled Even Leviticus. And it said this, the topic was Leviticus. And the writer said, I had a confession to make. I skipped over a lot of that reading. I told my Bible study group, I'm not going to be reading about skin diseases again. That's when my friend Dave spoke up. And Dave said, I know a guy who believed in Jesus because of the passage in Leviticus chapter 13. Dave explained that his friend, who was a doctor, had been an atheist, didn't believe at all in God. And he decided that before he completely rejected the Bible, he ought to read it. That's a good suggestion indeed for himself. The section on skin diseases in Leviticus fascinated him because it contains surprising details about contagious and non-contagious sores and how to treat them, if you go on chapter 14, it does. And he knew this far surpassed the medical knowledge of that day. Yet there it was in the Bible, in Leviticus. And he said that there's no way Moses could have known all this. And he thought, and the doctor began to consider that Moses really did receive his information from God. He read on and eventually he put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there we are. I hope that put you off for dinner. <laughs> but it's pretty horrible. And that, that is so important in this passage. The contrast between the prospects as this disease would progress and the character and the strength and the uh, admiration that Naaman had had before was, was almost too much to put into words. But, friends, that but of sin is in each and every one of us until it is dealt with and we'll see how it is dealt with indeed. Leprosy was a wasting, debilitating and eventually <coughs> dying disease. But you know, so is the but in our lives. <coughs> it's not a, a cheerful message and it's avoided by very many um, preachers and churches and modern songs and such like these days, but the horribleness of sin, in many ways it's the same, it's a wasting disease. It, it stops us from being the person we need to be for God, it stops us being effective for God, and it often begins to ruin our lives. It's debilitating and eventually dying. Romans 6, 23, Paul says that the wages of sin, the end result of sin, is death. But he goes on to say, doesn't he, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Naaman's only prospects would be isolation, decline, and eventually death. But there is hope, and there is a prospect of hope, and it comes from the most unlikely source. If you read on in chapter um, 5, it says there that now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel who served Naaman's wife. We have the picture of this little girl, not named, from the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria. She's a captive. She was a slave. But 
She clearly was a little girl with faith. How much she understood, we do not know, but she understood enough to believe that a prophet, a man of God, was the one person who would be able to help her uh, uh, Naaman overcome his horrible, horrible disease. The prophet Elisha would be able to heal. Now there's two amazing things take place here. We could relate, as I say, to each of the characters. We could relate to being little girls. Now that's difficult as we, we think of it, but you know what I mean? Someone whose faith is just strong enough to help, to suggest, to tell someone else what might well be helpful to them. But there's two remarkable things take place here. Firstly, I think it's remarkable that Naaman's wife listened to the girl. The girl was a slave. And yet clearly, I would suggest that the fact that this little girl had um, some faith in God had changed perhaps the relationship between her and Naaman's wife. There was a respect far beyond the person in charge and the, the, the slave girl as well. So I think it's amazing there that Naaman's wife listens to this little slave girl. But perhaps even more remarkable is Naaman listened to his wife. <laughs> now, now that is something, isn't it, ladies, that uh, um, husbands listen to their wives. It took a bit of time to come round to it, but he did. And the little girl's suggestion was actually followed up. And then someone else comes into the story here and is no less than the king of Syria. And when you realise that he, he was willing to listen as well, and also to think, I wouldn't say believe, but to think, well, is this possible? Is this possible? You know, when we really do consider uh, as, as young Christians or perhaps before we even become Christians, that the wonder of this gospel message you know, can it really be true? Can it really be true? It's just so profound. It is just so remarkable. Um, I, I can never understand why we don't get more excited than perhaps we do uh, in this marvel of mess. We're handling things of eternity. We're handling matters where the human soul is um, can be changed and be cleansed by the power of God. And we ought to come to church, to chapel, wherever it is we're attending. We should come excited. We really should. Now, we probably come thinking, oh, not him again. You know, that sort of excitement uh, goes down or I didn't know any hymns this morning or we played too slow or whatever it might be. You know, we, that's the sort of things we talk about afterwards. But here we've got some life-changing things taking place. And I suspect the king held on to this one thought, this might be possible it's worth a try and he sends off Naaman and what a pr um, procession it really is uh, as they all go off to um, Israel and to the king of Israel and the response then of the the other king the king of Israel is very understandable it, it's uh, he can't do anything he realizes he's no power physically or spiritually to help um, this man Naaman who he knew little about other than that he'd been successful in battle etc which was quite something in itself he said but he tears his very clothing off now I'm saying this morning we can relate to all the characters I, I don't suggest you do that right now um, I mean, it's best to stay as we are I think looking all very prim and proper today in church but it's an expression of, of his total um, fear of really what he's being challenged to do, to help. He knows he can't. And we can, again, relate to problems in our life and we turn to one person or another person in the health professions, educational professions, work professions, family, whatever it might be. But ultimately, that but, that sin, just like that leprosy in Naaman, that sin inside of us can only be dealt with by God. It cannot be dealt with by counsellors. It cannot be dealt with by pastors. It cannot be dealt with by good Christian friends. Things can help. We can play a part in bringing people to the real answer. But the but of sin can only be dealt with by the power of God. 
And so this poor king there says that he can really do nothing. Uh, and I, I'm not quite sure how um, uh, the prophet Elisha heard, whether the king did send a, a messenger or something, you know, are you able to help? I don't know. But we know that Elisha found out what was going on. And we'll come to that in a moment. But only God can deal with the butt of sin in our life. In that lovely epistle of John, right near the end of the Bible, uh, and passage that some may know very well, in uh, 1 John chapter 1, um, verses 8 to 10, John wisely there says that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We're not deceiving God, he knows we're sinners. We're not deceiving properly other friends who can identify the mark of sin in our life. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But John goes on, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse or purify us from all unrighteousness. So there stood Naaman, and what an impressive van he brought with him, hadn't he? I can imagine the chariots and the carts and the gifts and all of the servants and people who'd come along. This was really, really quite something. So what is the prophet going to do? Well, he didn't do what Naaman expected him to do. He didn't do what Naaman thought he ought to do. He sent a messenger. He sent a messenger with a message. I, I love this. There's, there's a humour here, you know, really, within this wonderful story. And yet it's so real, isn't it? God's way of dealing with us is so different than our own expectations. God's method and God's plan for all of our lives can so often be totally in contrast to what um, we would want him to do. And Naaman reacted furiously. This, this was a, a, a kick in the teeth, if we use that phrase. This was derogatory. This was humiliating. This is Naaman. I've got a message from the king. Uh, look at all of the, the soldiers and all of the helpers and all of the gifts and everything else I brought along. And he doesn't even come to the door himself. He sends a messenger with a message and that message is one that was not on Naaman's agenda that is not going to get rid of the butt in his life <coughs> or in our lives what a snub and look at his reaction Naaman's reaction in verse 11 he went away angry and he said I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, Lord his God. Surely he would wave his hand over the spot, cure me of my leprosy. You know, sometimes we do get into a position where we expect something great, something big, something spectacular to take place in our life. And it may be that some people <coughs> here this morning are still looking We've heard testimonies of people who've had these great experiences of coming to faith in Christ. Why hasn't it happened to me? I do remember, I'll be careful because one or two people here know the person concerned, so it won't be named. But I do remember we had a, a dear, dear curate who was a great friend of mine at St. Leonard's years ago, Rupert. Um, but Rupert loved exciting testimonies. You remember a few Bernard <laughs> as well. Uh, and I always had problems with some of these testimonies. And on one particular morning, we had a young lady, a um, great friend of mine then, uh, a young lady given a testimony how she had felt God would have been curing a kind of whiplash problem that she'd had. And this testimony got more and more and more exciting as it went on, that she'd suddenly felt a penetration uh, as God touched that that problem area and she felt a, a fire going up through her neck and it got really quite excited. And I have to say at the, the end of that testimony, most, I didn't, but most of our congregation applauded. And Rupert, our curate, was really, really excited. And so the service went on. And then at the end of that service, a dear, dear Christian lady 
um, <coughs> No Loves the Law. She came over to the organ where I was playing in tears. And she said, Richard, you know, I don't think I can be a Christian at all after all. And I've never, I can still see her face. I can still hear those words after 30 odd years or so in between. I said, why? Why? Well, she said, I've never felt anything like that girl was telling us today. I've never sensed anything sensational. I've never felt any great urge. I've never felt any great fire. I've never had any such great experience in my life. I, I don't think I can ever be a Christian, can I? And she was so distressed over it. And I said to the dear lady, I won't mention her name, I said, do you believe that you're a sinner who needs the forgiveness of a holy God? She said, yes. I said, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for sinners who need a holy God, touch of a holy God? Yes. And I said, do you believe that Jesus has forgiven your sins? I said, yes. I said, I'll tell you this, you're a Christian. <laughs> you're a Christian. She said, but I've never I said, nor have I. Nor have I. Never had an experience like that. Sally Aikis' testimony. Um, I won't criticise the testimonies, and some may have similar experiences as her. But I would say keep them personal. Keep them quiet. May they be a blessing to you, but be careful in sharing them with others. Because can we make others feel inferior? Why hasn't God done that in my life? Why hasn't God come in great power? Why haven't I heard, as it were, a voice from heaven speaking? Why, why haven't I felt that? That's not what is salvation. That's not what removes the butt of sin in our life. It's taking the message from the messenger and applying it through faith in our hearts. Naaman went away. And he went away and he'd kept two things. He'd kept all of his pride intact, but he'd also kept the leprosy. He was still going to die. He was still going to be unclean. He was still going to decline. Happily, there's someone else comes in the story. And again, we're not even told any of the names um, whatsoever. But he goes away in a rage, really. Because God hasn't done what he thought he would. And then it says that um, Naaman went away in a rage. But happily, some of those in his servant's band went to him and said, Look, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Now, Naaman had, in honesty, accepted a little bit of the message because he argues about the rivers. Well, look, there's rivers, you know, I know better rivers. I know cleaner rivers. I, I, I know other rivers. So he had accepted a little bit of the message, but he wouldn't obey what he'd been told to do in order to be clean. And very, very many people sitting in churches and chapels, large and small today, are in that position. Have accepted a bit of the message. Feel drawn to Christian church, to enjoy Christian fellowship, enjoy Christian worship. Uh, 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 sort of just inside, as it were, the cusp of Christian witness. But have not been willing to obey. Go and wash. You know, this really is the, the simplest gospel message you really could find anywhere. You don't really need any other words. I'm afraid you're going to get a few more words, but you don't really need any other words, do you? Basically, wash and be clean. Wash and be clean. You know, even I can understand that <laughs> and accept that. Even I can remember that. And every one of us here this morning can. Happily, Naaman listened again. And it cut through his pride. It cut through his wrong expectations. And then he went to that river as appointed. And we know what happened. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, just read a, a, a few verses there, which uh, I think are very relevant to us at this time. Verses 12 to 13, it says there that 
yet all who received him, that Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but of God. That's very different, isn't it, than many of our testaments. First time I ever gave a testimony um, publicly was um, at a, I think it was a Young Life campaign, uh, Beach Mission Reunion. I've never been on Beach Mission, but I was actually at Beach Mission Reunion. <coughs> And uh, remember Lance Pimworth, some of us will, and uh, I, I was not used to public speaking, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I thought of things to say, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I felt it went well, if we can put it that way afterwards. But afterwards, Lance came up to me and I'm eternally grateful. I wasn't at the time, but I'm eternally grateful to what he said to me. He said, Richard, you've let us all down. When you're young, I was about 19 then, mm -hmm. um, that hits you. It really did. It got me right here. And I felt it had gone so well. I'd already had people come up to me and say, well, thank you for that. That was, that was great, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And Lance said, you let us down. I said, why Lance? Well, he said, well, you told us all about what you believe, all about what you have done, all about you going to that particular meeting, all about you listening to that particular message, all about you making a move to the front of the meeting, all about you. And he was right. I, 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 I. I'd been Naaman in one sense. I really had. And I'd been telling all of the things that I was saying that God had done, but I hadn't given God the glory. I hadn't pointed to the one who could remove, and I prayed, had <coughs> removed that butt of sin in my life. And I learned a great lesson that day, that salvation is all of God. <coughs> it really is. We simply enter into salvation as the word of God challenges us, as the messengers of God bring that word to us, as we <coughs> listen and let God remove all of our own expectations, ideas and wishes and bring us to the heart of the message. Wash and be clean. Wash not in the river. Don't wash in the river ooze at the moment. It's a, <laughs> it's a filthy colour if you're in the water at the present time. This is washed in the blood. Of the Lamb. In a few moments, we're going to have a communion service. We take a sip of wine, and it is in remembrance of the blood that was shed. The significance of the water uh, that, uh, that he was going into really was looking him forward generations to the washing through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And like that dear, dear lady that uh, felt that she couldn't really be a Christian because she hadn't had any great experience. Could there be a greater experience than placing our faith and belief in that blood to remove the butt of sin in our life and to make us acceptable mm. to a holy God? Happily, Naaman understood that message. And after rejecting that message, after putting alternatives to that message, I've got better rivers, I know other rivers. When he obeyed the word of God, he washed and was clean. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 7, there's a challenge that says, Today if you will hear his voice, not audibly, through the Holy Spirit in our hearts, harden not your hearts. Harden not your hearts. Or the devil will do everything he can <coughs> to make our expectations something more than what God's great plan of salvation is. And if we will, like Naaman, allow our pride to be broken and to respond in obedience to the word of God, to flee as it were to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, to listen afresh to that old, old story, which it said, wouldn't it, is ever new, then he will know, we will know the cleansing that he had. Quickly as we close back to that epistle of John and verses five to seven there, where it says that uh, um, 
if we declare that God, that this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie. Be careful of this. We do not live the truth. But if we walk in the light, that's <coughs> embodying the message. This is embodying the saviour as the only um, saviour in our life if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son purifies us from all sin that's the message isn't it wash and be clean and naaman happily at last did what he'd been told to do and he went and washed and it said there that he washed himself seven times in the river jordan and as he went down and as he came up out of the water, his flesh was restored and he became clean like that of a young boy. You're almost a young boy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> we may not have many young boys in our presence, but we know the difference as we grow older and look in the mirror and see the wrinkles, don't we? Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Now, Naaman went on to make mistakes. Very quickly, he made the big mistake by thinking, well, we, we better pay for it, as it were. We better give um, all these wonderful gifts and then they will all be respected. That, that's not what God wants. God just wants our hearts. He wants our lives. He wants our faith. He wants to walk with us. He wants to be the light of our life. A light on a dark night, you don't hold it behind your back, you have it in front of you. And God wants through the Lord Jesus Christ to be within us, to lead us forward and have that confidence that if we have washed, and as we take these sacraments this morning, let's think of that in a whole new way. If we have washed in the blood of Christ through faith, we are cleansed. Go forth in that strength, in that confidence, just as we are, we can see, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for thee, and that you bids me, you call me, come to me. You may need to come this morning in faith. O Lamb of God, I come. Let's sing that.